Cruz Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, and Giovanni. Welcome everyone to Fortress on a Hill, a podcast about U.S. foreign policy, anti-imperialism, skepticism, and the American way of war. I'm Henry. My pronouns are he, him. Thank you for joining us today. With me is my co-host Giovanni. Hey man, how are you doing? Hey Henry, how are you doing? Uh, doing well. Giovanni uh, Reyes, pronouns he, him. And we are here with Shiloh Emelin and Rachel Tucker to discuss the state of reproductive justice and freedom in the U.S. military. Shiloh and Rachel, welcome to Fortress on Hill. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, very happy to have you both. So I'm going to give some background on you guys, and then we'll uh, we'll get started talking. Shiloh Emelin, pronouns they, them, theirs is a queer, trans, non-binary creature living with their fluffy cat on Ololand, Ohlone, Land, also known as the Bay Area, California. Their worldview and moral compass were turned upside down when they deployed with a Marine helicopter support unit in Al Ambar province, Iraq, and then Kuwait City. They joined About Face, Veterans Against the War in 2018, with the hope and action to catalyze change and repair the harms caused by the military industrial complex. Shadow believes that the reclamation and celebration of our bodies, our joy, and our pleasure is at the core of demilitarizing ourselves, our beliefs, and the structures we currently live within. They are thrilled to have the chance to care for the about face community in light of collective liberation and collective healing. And Rachel, Rachel is an anti-imperialist veteran of the U.S. Army from 2002 to 2011. She's an educator and activist who lives in San Antonio, Texas, but was born and raised in Miami, Florida. She is a member of About Face, Veterans Against the War, and the Party for Socialism and Liberation, and has been an active organizer with the M- Mujeres Coalition, who has been leading in the women's struggle in the city of San Antonio. Just to get us started, I've been trying to formulate how we were going to do this discussion around the idea of informing all the listeners of our podcast, but specifically veterans and the anti-war folks that listen, which to be very clear is a lot of men. There are a lot of men that listen to our podcast. And as to be clear and present about where U.S. military policy sit today regarding abortion access and reproductive freedom. And so to start us off, I want to talk about some of the hardships that are created by these policies even for birthing people who are not actively working to have kids. Rachel, could you start us off? Tell us what you think about that in terms of the hardships this creates for service members and the environment within within the military. Our federal government has basically turned its back and has used um, abortion as a token for elections now for decades. Essentially, it's turning something that is a healthcare practice into a, something quote unquote moral, right? Something political. That's basically why we are in the situation we're in, right? And on top of that, like the right wing grasp that our, the Supreme Court is under, and how essentially nine, six unelected Supreme Court leaders quote-unquote leaders or justices just reversed the progress that was one with one in tears by like women and people 50 years ago and so it's the beginning uh, it's the tip of the spear of an undemocratic attack on working class on people we're seeing, yes, 
that it's an abortion. It is sovereignty. It is autonomy of women and and people. But it's it is the beginning of more things being rolled back, and such as voting rights, such as possibly affirmative action, and in in Texas right now. We have three anti-abortion laws, actually, that are in place and all depend on each other to really criminalize abortion and criminalize providers. And with up to $100,000, they're caught helping somebody, aiding and abetting, and up to life in prison. And vigilante culture with SBA that was passed last year actually is rewards people with $10,000 for snitching on, on people that are having and needing abortions. And so essentially with, and then the third, the third law, anti-abortion law in Texas is the 1925 statute. It dates back, its original um, passing dates back to 1857, I believe, pre-Civil War time, and essentially knocking women back 175 years in the state of Texas and people that need services, right? And so that includes trans, non binary like you name it, right? And it, it's people that... And then, for example, San Antonio, right? I'm talking very local, but like San Antonio has five, five military bases. And the, the Air Force basic training is here. And as, as is a lot of medical training for the Army efforts in Houston. And so we have a lot of military people in our city and people that, that will come in knowing, not knowing that abortion is criminalized here. And like, you, you're gonna have to figure out how to get the healthcare service that you need by going out of state. <clears throat> Civilians will have to go all the way to New Mexico. That's the closest area. So hundreds of miles away. And many people, many women and, and people don't have the money. They don't have the time. Like if you're not in the military, you're working a wage job, or you have to ask for time off from your work and you don't really have a lot of working class people don't have that luxury. We know that rich people do. They don't have to worry about where they got to go, what, where, how much time they're going to be gone or anything like that. Like they can just go fly wherever they want and get the healthcare service they need. But working class people don't have that luxury, especially working class people of color. And in black communities that have been targeted for decades and, and even centuries. And so... When service members come to Texas, essentially, it's gonna be it's gonna be a nightmare with all the trauma, the military sexual trauma that happens, all the rape, all of the harassment, all of the abuse that does happen, and so the hardships that we're about to see are going to be like outrageous, completely outrageous. The amount of deaths that we are probably going to see is going to be like outrageous and actually like criminal on the events of the state and, and even the federal government. I was thinking about you mentioning about the, the military and the enlisted community specifically is that it it's all almost entirely of working class people and that depending on what kind of job in the military you might be set up okay when you go out but a lot of people simply return to 
the same hometown to the same econo economic conditions that they were in previously. And yet, you know, that for all the military's pomp and bluster about it's the medical benefits that you get during the time that you're in, that none of that extends to reproductive rights. None of that. It's essentially as if you were never in the military and had any care in that direction the entire way. And again, the military does, as far as the people within it and out, separate from the reproductive access portion, seems to do well. And even the VA seems to learn lessons and, and improve itself bit by bit as time goes on. But this is one aspect that is completely excluded, put in that taboo box. We were talking before about the, uh, that it's been, that you mentioned about that the right wing has turned it into a, to a moral question, a moral issue, that the choices that birthing persons have to make is now a moral question for people that have nothing to fucking do with it and have no right to be able to say these people are not able to have that access. Uh, and you talk about the how Rachel broke down how the reproductive the women's reproductive rights abortion has how it's been politicized has been become a political chip for all these years. Roe versus Way was passed was nineteen seventy three. Yep, and it's just been back and forth. So they use a political chip, and then most people didn't know until what Texas passed that to bypass Roe versus Wade, what Texas did was pretty much jeopardize the individuals, make make deputies out of the individuals, just like Rachel talked here, and made them like vigilante groups. The old West posse groups and just take the law into your own hands. And then and put people, particularly people in the healthcare community, put them in a bind because now these people could be sued just by, uh, by giving advice, giving advice. One of the things I remember when, when the whole Texas thing came out, right, which was signed, what was assigned, it was signed in on September, 2021, am I correct? The law that uh, the governor Abbott signed. About the uh, you know, abortion, where it says right here, Texas, a pair of laws together, bad abortion of all stages of pregnancy without exceptions for rape or incest, and with narrow exceptions for pregnancy for pregnant people at risk of death. Senate Bill 8, SB 8, signed by Governor Greg Abbott, which took effect on September 1, 2021. I remember seeing also, uh, it, I think it was either Uber or Lyft. They pull out a statement saying there because the law is just so broad that even a a, a Lyft driver, Uber driver, could be subject to to being sued just by transporting someone to an, to to a clinic. I remember Uber. It was either Uber or Lyft that came out with a statement saying that they're looking into this law and they're looking for any and they're looking at any possible repercussions that any of the drivers might have because of this law and they're talking about how they're going to fight it. They're going to help people with legal fee if it comes down to it. Yeah. So I just want to transition. Why if Roe versus Wade has been, was pretty much settled in 1973, why are we still talking about this? Didn't it become constitutional? What happened? No, it was, it was something okay. from that point. It, it continued to be a political football each side moved to the other as things if i think the hyde amendment came out in was it, i think it was 79 and so that was only six years with even if the, the federal government could be involved that they would have been able to do that but with the hyde amendment that means that no money whatsoever no federal dollars goes to abortion access or reproductive access except for rape, incest, and life of the mother. And you find that if you really bear down on some of the regulations, that life of the mother is not very specific onto what it is, that it can easily be one of those things that they say, no, sorry, we don't, we're not 
thoroughly convinced enough that this woman is going to die specifically as a result of her pregnancy, and therefore we won't terminate it. I'm not saying that's that's a decision that they would have to make, but there there's a lot of room in there for them to be able to say no to look like they're still providing some kind of access. But no, it was never enshrined in federal law, the right to the right to an abortion. It was only the Supreme Court decision. But apparently it could have been enshrined to federal law. It could have been called Absolutely. Right, but our our leadership or his leadership failed us on that and just kept it as a political football for political they didn't want to pay the cost. They didn't want to pay the toll of having to deal with the backlash that would come from something like that. They, it, it just it, it was just not it was way too big of a risk. The Obama administration they just wouldn't they just wouldn't take risks like that, and I can't imagine what and then we're. And then, of course, now we have Joe Biden. Joe Biden is the anti-abortionist in chief. Uh, and he was part of the original coalition that helped push the Hyde Amendment through. Let me get my list here. I've got a whole bunch of little things about him. But, but no, exactly what you're saying. Now, we, it's... It's my understanding that if the president wanted to write an executive order and wanted to take space on military bases to conduct abortions, that he could, and it would be entirely within the law, that they could take a portion of Randolph Air Force Base or Fort Sam Houston and allow civilians to be able to come and get reproductive care if he wanted to take that on. But again, no one has the political huevos, so to speak. To be able to do it, it's just, just it's just not worth it. And the rest, of the everyone looking at this, most mostly liberals and leftists, were looking at this, and it, it's just another thing that you won't fight for. We won't fight for a higher minimum wage. We won't fight for the ability to keep jobs here rather than sending them overseas. The ability to, to unionize without having to worry about an a-hole like the CEO of Starbucks bearing down on you and threatening your job and promising benefits to people as long as they don't join the union. This fits all into that cloud of bullshit. So let me add to something. You set up political risk, right? According to a Pew Research poll taken in June 13, 2022, 61% of Americans says abortion should be legal. So that means that's a popular, that should be a popular uh, issue. So where is the political risk? I felt to see that. I could say a little bit about that around, to me, with the Biden administration, as of was September 9th, they passed that the VA will cover start allowing abortions and for abortions but with a lot of the things that we see with the biden administration it's like this big they want the kudos and the cookies and the big parade for this thing that they're doing but then the fine print is that it actually doesn't do anything it doesn't like to change the material conditions for people even though the va now on paper allows access for abortions and abortion counseling, which they hadn't done before because of the Hyde Amendment. It's only under those two circumstances now, which are the rape or incest or life-threatening to the person who's pregnant. And then even within that, the they're allowing, they have opened up access to abortions, but they haven't, there's no personnel that are trained at the VA to do this. And just the, uh, I was just doing some, yeah, some research around that and just seeing, because I know as a trans person that there's often a lack of, of healthcare services and at the VA and specific to trans health, specific to reproductive health for a trans person, there's zero 
access to healthcare. And looking into that, I was just seeing that the VA lacks, they also lack like pregnancy, delivery, and postpartum services. That's not something that was offered at the VA until I think the late 90s. And so all of that care was always outsourced. North Texas, the North Texas VA healthcare system went all of 2020 without a gynecologist on staff that was also outsourced. So there's, there's this big broad, like, oh, we're actually doing something progressive from the Biden administration. But then when you look into it, just, just below the surface, it, it shows its ass that they're actually not doing, they're not changing any circumstances for people. Yeah. And I want to hop in there because absolutely even being in the military, like actual, like reproductive health was a joke. Like they, they really just didn't treat like women for the services that, that, that were needed appropriately in my opinion. And there is a quote that the VA uses, which we, we use in a different way in our local fights, um, which says like pregnant veterans and VA beneficiaries deserve to have access to world-class reproductive care when they need it the most. That's what our nation owes them. And that's what we at the VA will deliver. And that's by the secretary of the VA, I think Dennis McDonald. And it's just, we use it to basically say like, why not everybody? Like, why not our people have this access on federal land, right? Which can happen with the stroke of a pen and through an executive order, order by the president of the United States. It's legal. It's legal to have abortions on federal land. And so like we use that quote because it's like perfectly convenient, like this right wing or in industry of death <laughs> is basically say that the, that veterans are the ones that deserve this, right? After everything that, that we put them through. And I just think it's, it's just a crop of shit to continue one, like the recruitment the continuance of making veterans and two to show that the federal government has, can actually do something if it really wants to like they have the political will why doesn't the why doesn't congress why doesn't the president like he can definitely end the filibuster and they can definitely and the Hyde Amendment, which before the Hyde Amendment was passed in the, in, I think you said 79, right? They were basically servicing like 300, they had serviced 300,000 people. And now they're, they've taken away like the safety nets for our most vulnerable, those that do need Medicaid, Medi Medicaid, Medicare. And to have families that need support. And, and then now they, they've criminalized it. And essentially, like, they, they can, they, he can, the president and Congress can, especially like the president can pass an executive order and legalize abortion like once and for all and, and just stop playing games with, so many people, like half of this population, it is a popular issue. It's actually a mandate. Like when over 60% of your population is needing, demanding this as a human right, it is a mandate. And so that's why 
It's just like, why aren't they listening? Why are they doing the complete opposite? And so that's why I say it's like the tip of the spear for more undemocratic reversals of of things that we've struggled for. Um, But yeah. I think you hit the the nail on the head when you said political will. It's a lack of political will. It's on the way talking about a a duopoly here, a a political system, two party system, but pretty much is the same, the same party, just two faces of it, where politics is made into a sport, made into a sport and not to bring anything tangible for the people, which always is always there, the recycle. The recycled rhetorics, every, every political, every two years, every four years, we see the same recycled rhetoric just to keep people there on the edge, just to keep people there just watching, keep people there just right there. This time, we, if we elect the, the correct person, this person, this is going to happen to the next cycle. And the cycle, the same rhetoric comes around, get recycled again. But this is what this abortion deal has been for the last, uh, what, 50 years almost since Roe versus Wade, you have this political football going back and forth. Look, one party, I guess one party, uh, seemed to have the political will to continue moving forward, which is the Republican party. But at the same time, it was questionable. A lot of people would just say, because they, they kept prom- pro- promising the same thing every election cycle, this time we're going to go into to outlaw abortion and so on and so forth. They've been going with the same thing for the last 40 something years. I guess this time around they, they, they hit the jackpot. But it's, like I say, it's been a political will. Anytime this could have been codified and made into, made law into law, but there was no political will because there was a, it was a topic. It was a, a, a political talking point that both parties used against each other for competition to compete for, for, uh, for that seat at whatever, whether it's city council or Congress or Senate, whatever, this or that. And neither party actually had the political will to move forward with it until now, I guess, until Texas did. But uh, now it has other ramifications, but it was just a talking point. It was just a talking point for these political, for these two political, this duopoly, this I don't know what you, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> it's the, there's two wings of the same bird. I don't know. <laughs> I'm curious what you all think about the status of this topic within anti-war and anti-imperialist spaces. Um, in in my book, it, it's something that you don't see nearly enough. It's not a discussion that's had that this, it, you, you just don't see people discussing it, which is, which it, to me is messed up given the huge impact that it has on, on troops, on veterans, and of course the rampant space for misinformation among non-birthing folks. We, I want, like I mentioned, when I we started the episode, I want to be able to educate and empower cisgender guys to be able to understand this and understand how it affects people, even though that it's not something that they're going to directly experience. What do you guys think about the any war community? And it's is it making space for this topic and this discourse, do you think? Not nearly enough, in my opinion. I think that we can't talk about access to abortion, specifically within the military, without also talking about MST, military sexual trauma, and its pervasiveness. And that is also a topic that kind of gets 
pushed aside within the anti-war movement because it's seen, I think, falsely, obviously, but I think it's seen as a, only specific to, to certain people or that it's not impacting the whole culture of the military. And <clears throat> yeah, I don't know what's going on out there. Yeah, I don't think it's talked about enough. And I think that it's, to me, it, it's a cultural shift of saying that, that pregnancy, that creating families is not on one, one person. It's, it's a community event. It's a community coming together. And I think it's dual individualized instead of seen as a community and i have some more to say on it but i'll keep it at that for now cool yeah i think shiloh is, is more in in the actual like community than i am i dabble but I see it like a like anti-war, anti-imperialist, and then the abortion issue. Generally, I see it as an issue like of sovereignty, self-determination, and autonomy, like at the most uh, intimate level, and so that you can draw the, the links to imperialism because imperialism is denying somebody of self-determination, is denying of all peoples of sovereignty, is denying whole peoples of their autonomy. And so it is not the same, but it can be linked, right? The personal, like community, like Shiloh was saying, that, that community, to one community to another community on those on on those uniting fronts, right? Really important on uniting fronts. I think like as far as like the military, I don't know if the anti-war community, but I think just the military in general is very anti-woman, anti like everything that it's representing by something that's not masculine, right? And it tries really to to just eliminate that and pretend it's not them. Put your hand up and make sure like you have your chest doesn't bounce. Make sure you hide like things. I don't know, like they do things in a very specific way in order to, it, it's contradictory. So highlight your femininity and then hide. Either way, I think like MST, like Shiloh was talking about, is something like within the military community that is part of it, right? Just like racism is. And it's, a, it's supremely gross and unfortunate. And it is basically a mirror of, of our ruling class, of our society, of power, control. And the way that is dealt with, right, is also a, of a mirror, I think, of our society when we don't want to admit the root causes of it, right? And I don't, like I said, I don't hang that much in the, in the anti-war community. But when I do, it's always interesting. It's always good. But yeah, th those are my comments on that. So just for uh, audience that don't know, MST is a military sexual trauma, right? There's a, there's assault on, on women's reproductive rights. Does it constitute, in your mind, as a form of violence against women? 
100%. (laughs) It's seriously like the culmination, I think, of the war that they've drummed up for decades, right? Because from this, we're going to see, we already had an issue with domestic violence. We already had an issue with, we have a constant issue with poverty constant issue with access to like contraception, access to healthcare. That's why we should all like be fighting for universal healthcare. But but yeah, it's a complete it's violence. Just once once you remove somebody's say over their own body, it's violence. And on top of that it's it's not just control over yourself, it's control over, you say you you have a family, right? Like you say you have two, three kids and then it's, and then you're scraping by, you don't have enough money to really even give those two kids the life that you want to give them, right? And so now you're, you're basically, you have no choice. And to bring a new, a new baby in, and you know, it, it is violence, right? Like when you don't have a choice. Anyways, take a stab at Shiloh if you want. <laughs> the only thing I would add is that it shouldn't be a surprise that the that. MST military sexual trauma is so pervasive anywhere the that militaries exist and are sexual violence is rampant right and that's across time and so it shouldn't be a surprise because the military let's be real the purpose of the the military is violence and so it shouldn't be a surprise that MST is so pervasive in this within this violent culture and just yeah just to to add some context for the pervasiveness one out of three non-cis men in the military report sexual trauma or sexual assault within the military and that's self-reported so we know that's extremely low and, and yeah as Rachel was saying, like any time that you take someone's choice away, someone's autonomy away, someone's sovereignty away, that's violence and that's halting their their freedom and restricting them. We get asked often what people can do to help support the podcast. One really powerful way to help us grow and reach more people is to leave us a review. You can do that on iTunes, which is the best place to leave a review iTunes does reach the most people these days. The next best place is Facebook. Go to our Fortress on a Hill Facebook page and look for the Reviews tab. Money is tight these days for everyone, especially in the lingering shadow of COVID. Penny pinching to make it through the month often doesn't give people the funds to contribute to a creator they support. So we consider it the highest honor that folks help us fund the podcast in any dollar amount they're able. Patreons is the main place to do that. And for supporters who can donate $10 a month or more, they will be listed right here as an honorary producer, like these fine folks, Fahim Shirazi, James Obar, James Higgins, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Daniel Fleming, Michael Karen, Ren Jacob, Howard Reynolds, Rick Coffey, Scott Spaulding, Spooky Tooth, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so very much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. And now, let's get back to the podcast. I, 
I got a chance to talk to Lyle Jeremy Rubin recently about his new book, and he talks about in it about the nature of military indoctrination and how the military wants its members to be able to sl slowly indulge rather than restrain or check wanton acts of violence. Is that we want people to be violent when we want them to be violent and not be violent at other times. And then we expect that it won't spill over onto people, onto their families. We don't have control over that. We don't get to decide what's going to happen inside and with a person as they go through their experiences. And Shiloh, like you said, this is stuff that is, is historical, that wherever militaries go, there is sexual violence and trauma. Okinawa, for example, has a, a huge problem with that. And I know that the UCMJ and the military justice apparatus that are involved with that do their best to deflect. They try to stonewall local authorities. They try to make it so it's hard to actually do anything meaningful. And that's not even considering uh, cultural aspects to it, depending on where it happened. But no, I just, it, it, the circle back around is that the, 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 it, if you're a soldier and you understand that denying somebody reproductive access and justice is violence, what, what does that say about how you're going to be cared for? What does that say? Because eventually the, the, the rules are going to lean in a way that's not politically advantageous to somebody else. But we're okay with it. We're okay with it. We accept it. That the we accept that this is the military's culture. Royal we, not us talking. But Giovanni, what do you uh, what are you thinking, man? What what comes to mind for you about all this? Going back on that violence. So I just heard what you said about switching on and off violence and particularly speaking about our military, which is spread out throughout the world in about 130 countries. What came up to mind is what is called a SOFA agreement. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the SOFA agreement, which is the status of arm status of forces agreement that a, that the U S government makes with the host country and the host country that is hosting a military base has to agree to this agreement before a, a military base is to be stationed there other than what you're seeing in Syria right now, where the Syrian government has not agreed to host a military, a U.S. military base there, but they're hosting one whether they like it or not. Well, it's a different story. But in the SOFA agreement, it's an agreement where the local government of a country pretty much cannot prosecute a U.S. soldier pretty much. It has to go through, through the UCMJ channels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens is that a lot of MST or, you know, or, uh, sexual assault made by U.S. soldiers or on a local national of a third country or of another country where the U.S. base is stationed at, right? That person, that victim usually does not see any justice because that the soldiers are not, cannot be prosecuted by the local government. And they usually are given to the, uh, to the military to deal with that particular soldiers, all soldiers and whatnot. And we know that American women serving in the military often do not see justice when they're assaulted by their fellow soldiers. You see, imagine if a local national from another country will see justice if they're assaulted by a U.S. soldier. Damn sure we're all of it. Most likely they won't. And that's part of the soul for agreement. Any, uh, yeah, that's what came up to mind when, when you were talking about that, Henry. I wanted to just follow that with, so after, uh, a sexual assault happens to someone in the military, what happens next? And, and talk about that a bit because it, it goes into this lack of access to abortion and, and counseling and 
lack of access to reproductive care. So after after a, a sexual assault happens, and say the person becomes pregnant from that, the it, it's slowly changing now after the Vanessa Guillen law is passed but not quite enacted yet and, and taking place yet, where there's the survivor has to go to the chain of command, like to their chain of command, who often is part of the problem, right? Is part of the violence, is part of the assault. And so that that will stop a lot of people from seeking justice or whatever you want to call it, seeking care. And also if they go through the chain of command, it's also up to their chain of command to allow that person or not allow that person to have leave to go access an abortion or reproductive care. It's up to their chain of command and the military the doctors to, to say whether this was caused by rape or incest. And so at Every stage of the process, the power is taken out of the survivor's hands it's, and given to the military chain of command. And so I just, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that and just as a harm reduction step, the least we can do is keep pushing for civilian oversight into how the criminal process is handled within the military and get out of the chain of command's hands. I think that's something that, going back to your previous question, Henry, something within the anti-war movement, we can really start pushing for a measure of harm reduction is to have civilian oversight. What's the current, what's the current policy of the U.S. military when it comes to, to reproductive right and abortion? Let me see what we have here. You mean as far as accessing? Yeah. From what I understand, it's, yeah, you must go through your chain of command and request medical leave. And your chain of command can ask questions around why or whatnot, how long you need what recovery process you need or time you need, and then can deny or not from that point. I make, I'm pretty sure that's the process that's used right now. So this is what the, the, N, the NDAA for fiscal year 2023 says about abortion in the military. It says under Title 10, Section 1093 of the United States Code, USC, DOD is prohibited from using funds or facilities to perform an abortion unless the pregnancy resulted from rape or incest or the life of the mother will be in danger if the fetus were carried to term. Abortions that do not meet this criteria are considered non-covered abortions. This provision was first enacted in 1984 prior to adding the statutory restriction, Congress had included provisions in annual defense appropriation bills, restricting funding the military to perform abortions, starting with appropriations for FY 1979, PL 95-457-683. Such abortion funding restrictions in, in, in appropriation bills are also referred to as high type amendments after their original sponsor representatives, Henry J. High, federal, federal regulations and TRICARE policy also prohibited abortions constantly in referral preparations and follow-up care for non-covered abortions. And these services are not available in the military treatment facilities. Service members and their family members who seek a non-covered abortion with a civilian provider typically pay out of pocket for all expenses associated with the procedures, including any travel, required travel. Now, under chapter four of title 10, United States authorizes, United States code it authorizes leave or sick leave. It does authorize convalescent leave in connection with the birth of a child. Some observers have 
question where they're absent. Specific statutory authority of commanding officer could deny a service member's request to, to leave or leave and seek abortion. So what I'm understanding here from is that, that the military does not perform unless those criteria are hit, which is uh, the uh, rape, incest, or the life of the mother, and the service member has to do, has to, uh, the service member has to, if they want to uh, have an abortion, they have to do it on their own, pay out of pocket. They can take leave, they can take sick leave, and they can take condolence leave, but it's up to the commander, I, I believe. That's what, if I understand that correctly. Yes. So that's the, so that's what the NDA for fiscal year 23 talks about military abortion policies. I think, I think we've hit most of the, uh, most of the topics I wanted to touch on, uh, in discussing reproductive justice, we had made time to talk about Rachel's article. I wanted to make sure, is there anything else you guys want to include with this? Any closing, closing statements about the status of reproductive freedom in the military or MST, anything like that? Yeah, no, I wanted to mention like one of the, one of the campaigns that we have going on in San Antonio right now that if it's passed, it, I mean, it won't supersede the law, but it would, it's, it's, it'll be something. So essentially we're demanding that Bear County become an abortion sanctuary. And so we have nine demands and of those nine demands, there's, there's a couple that, that I want to highlight. One of them is something we've already mentioned and it's the use of uh, federal lands for providing like abortions free and on demand and safe <laughs> the free and on demand on, on, on federal Spaces, especially like in San Antonio, we have SAMC, which is like a World Cross Hospital. And we can, there's no reason why we can't be used for, for veterans and for civilians, for everybody. But so if, with this, res, if this resolution is passed, like basically it's, it'll be more sim, symbolic, right? But at the same time, it is something to be done to actually put stand up to the very draconian undemocratic anti-abortion laws that the state has passed against more than half of its population. But yeah, I think service members would probably also, but it would also help them. Uh, when it, when they come and we're in common, we're basically meeting with commissioners and different entities in the county to see what they're willing to do to protect their people. And so, yeah, just wanted to mention, just wanted to mention that campaign that we've got going on here. Sounds great. Thank you for, uh... Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. So I just want to note back on abortion. One of the things that hit me about, about kind of this pro-lifers, people that, you know, that engage in pro-life and they're militant about it, is that they don't, a lot of, they don't seem to care much once the baby is born. They don't really seem to care much about uh, the conditions the baby is going to be in. They don't seem to care much about the mother. They don't seem to care about uh, you know, pretty much what happens to the to their family once the baby is born. They're all, you know, there's a Planned Parenthood clinic near the, the DA hospital where you know where I go to. 
and I see people there, there's, they're doing a campaign there. What they do is, I don't know if you've seen it, Rachel, they'll sit in front of, they'll sit in front of it, in front of the, the, the Planned Parenthood office and they'll record it and they have megaphones and the mm -hmm. and people that are going in, they'll, they, they'll start talking to them. To the megaphone, start talking to him. I mean, that's that com that constitutes harassment. Well, uh, and they and they'll sit there, and they have they'll, they're in the sidewalk. So they're facing the clinic, and they're taking pictures and they're taking videos. And like I said, people that are walk uh, going in and out, they're actually trying to engage them in conversation and talking to them with megaphones and so forth. Uh, yeah. So my thing is right because right now we're in election campaign right now and I'm getting all these flyers for both for me and both for that and this is a red state and one of the things one of the talking point is that about handouts we don't give handouts et cetera et cetera et cetera now what do they mean by that they'll give handouts cut taxes and Increase budget for police, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is that when you talk about poverty, right? Poverty, the face of poverty is in anywhere is the woman, the face of poverty. The, the woman is the one that has to deal with the burden of everyday life, particularly if we you know not only take care of ourselves, but our children, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, but yeah, so this is, it's very criminal what is, what has been done here with this, this like, Rachel said this draconian law is these, uh, this violence against the autonomy of, of women in this country. Just because they, they, just because they're taking away the restricting reproductive life and taking away from women, their autonomy, their ability to have safe abortion, right? Does not mean that it's not going to end. Abortion is not going to stop. It's just going to be done by other means. And that's something that people need to think about. And what are the consequences of that? Yeah. I don't know if anybody want to jump in and the thoughts on uh, So, yes, my <clears throat> concluding thoughts are just around If at any point you're thinking that this is a topic that doesn't impact you, maybe think a little deeper, think a little more, yeah, a little more under the surface. This to me is possibly slash probably just the start of an avalanche against bodily autonomy, against sovereignty. We already see it right in this, the repercussions of having these anti-abortion laws and criminalizing people who, who provide care. We already see that the ripple effect of that happening, in, uh, extending to other people's rights and access to healthcare, like trans youth who are trying to access healthcare are now being criminalized, the people providing healthcare are now being criminalized. So this, we're, we're already seeing, they're kind of like starting to, they start this process, they see the impacts of it and they're like, okay, how can we put that on another sub subcategory of, of people? And so to me, this is just the start of an avalanche of that process. So. It, it baffles me. It disheartens me to see people take a step back thinking it doesn't impact them and only step up when something firsthand impacts them. It will eventually ripple out. So you might as well stand up and do something about it now. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Wait. I mean, look at this. Every year worldwide, about 42 million women with unintended pregnancy shoot abortion. Nearly half of these procedures, this is from the uh, publication Medical Central, 20 million are unsafe. Some 68,000 women die of unsafe abortion annually, making it one of the leading causes of maternal 
mortality, 13%. Of the women who survive unsafe abortions, 5 million will suffer long-term health complications. Unsafe abortions is thus a pressing issue. Both of the primary methods for preventing unsafe abortion, less restrictive abortion laws, and greater contraceptive use face social, religious, and political obstacles, right? This is what it comes down to. It comes down to a religious religious position, religious position in this country that being converted into a political position, particularly in developing nations where most unsafe abortion, 97% of court, right? In developing occur. Even where these obstacles are overcome, women and healthcare providers need to be educated about contraceptives, contraception and the ability of legal and safe abortion and women needs better access to safe abortion and post-abortion services. Otherwise, desperate women facing the financial burden and social stigma of unintended pregnancy and believing they have no other option, continue to risk their lives by undergoing unsafe abortions. And I, and I want to transition with this with something, right? Uh, like Roe versus Wade, 1973, made abortion legal in the United States, right? But before that, women were still having abortions in the United States before Roe versus Wade, right? And one thing in particular that caught my eye, because Henry mentioned uh, Rachel's article, article that she just did, we'll talk about that. And the second is the island of Cuba, for example. Island of Cuba has been practicing, it's the first country in the Americas to practice uh, safe abortion, right? It goes all the way to 1936. 1936, they've been practicing safe abortion, right? At the time, Cuba was, that was before the revolution, Cuba was a, uh, a neo-colony in the United States. And it was a, Havana was uh, Las Vegas, of a, a playground for the wealthy and, and mobsters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But one of the things that's interesting about Cuba is that women, American women, will do this. At the time that it was, Cuba was, had a abortion tourism where American women will go to Cuba to have abortion because it was illegal in the United States. So they have safe abortions in Cuba. It wasn't enshrined and it was, it was, abortion was legal for those who could pay, all right? Now it wasn't accessible for everyone. And granted, and given the fact that Cuba is a, is extremely, is a highly Catholic country. So it's shown upon most people didn't use it, right? But it was mostly for, it was mostly a luxury of the wealthy, more a luxury of those who can pay. It wasn't until the revolution in 1959 and afterwards that it was made accessible to everyone free of charge by the state. That's an interesting note. But Cuba just did something other, something else revolutionary recently when it came down to, to family structures and, and, and autonomy, family autonomy. And Rachel, you want to talk to us about that a little bit? Sure. So yeah, on September 25th, Cuba basically approved through referendum on the newest families code. and. Basically, the first family's code was a revolutionary document in and of itself, written in 1965. And so, essentially, uh, starting from that one, they had talked about what we call the second shift and how, like, housework is not just to be shared by, it's not just for the woman, it's to be shared by those that live in the house. And... And then it, it also did many other things as far as like regulating, like what, what society would, should strive for, what, how to push, right? Like society to be, uh, match the revolutionary move project that, that she was going for. And so like with this family's code. That's what it did. It pushed the people socially to to get to a to get to the social consciousness they needed to be at. 
to reflect the revolutionary project, right? And this year, the Cuban government and the Communist Party of Cuba basically said that it is una deuda. This is something that has been that has been needing to happen for a very long time to reflect the families that exist, the diversity of families, right? And so with this new code of families, like it has legalized same-sex marriage, same-sex adoption. It has legalized what they call solidarity gestation. And so that's what we call surrogacy here, but it's not for profit, right? This is, a, it's, it's a family document just like made, made and centered on love, on affection. It has given rights to grandparents to see their grandchildren. It has given more equality when it comes to divorced families. It has given more rights and responsibilities for children that they should be treated like little people with that have valid opinions. It's a, it's a really, really revolutionary document. And compared to the United States, where we're regressing, the society is, our government has forcefully made us regress. The people are in there, right? The people are pushing and need the government to reflect them. But right now the government stepping on us, not for too long, because we're going to, we're fighting back, but in Cuba, <clears throat> they're pushing even, they're pushing their society forward even more, and they're accepting the development that society has, has done, has created for itself, the diversity of family, and has taken it as a strength. And it's a way to, to push forward to the society that they want to continue building and to the revolution that they have sworn to, to basically uphold and devote and commit themselves to. And so it's, I, I encourage y'all to read the article. It's on Liberation News. And definitely read all you can about it because it's something that a blockaded country, 60 year blockaded country was able to do. And it demonstrates it as always is the beacon light for liberty, for freedom, for sovereignty. And it is a model for us to strive for here in the US, especially now with these repressions and those to come. And it demonstrates the importance of internationalism of being there for each other here, the working class here and the broad together, learning from each other, communicating, fighting together. And it demonstrates the power of solidarity with our LGBTQ brothers and sisters and not binary folks, with our black community, Latino community, immigrant community, and all, all of our rights are on the chopping block, right? And we all have to stand together <clears throat> and demonstrate the power that we do have, which Cuba has shown us how to do it. Giovanni, did you want to uh, jump in before we close up? Yeah, it was it was great having uh, both uh, Charlotte and Rachel, both of you. And uh, to your perspective on these topics, and I think we we close on a good note with uh, with this this hope, this people pushing back, and uh, yeah, and we have examples to draw from. Going back to to Rachel's article, what's the name of the article, Rachel? Title. Yeah. It's called Supermajority of Cubans Vote for Revolutionary Families Code. Liberation News. Liberation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. When can, where, uh, 
do you, where can we, people want to continue this topic offline and where can we find you guys in you guys Twitter, Facebook, where do you guys are at? I'm on Facebook and I have Instagram. I think my handle on Instagram is Raja underscore Tuck, but you can just type my name, Rachel with two L's Tucker, and you can find me. Yeah. I don't, my cat has an Instagram. I don't, but you can, yeah. I do some of the social media for About Face, Veterans Against War. You can definitely follow them on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and see what the anti-war veterans are up to. And yeah, just really grateful for this opportunity to share my perspective and to be a community with y'all. Henry, where can we find Portraits on the Hill? We can find Fortress on a Hill at our website, www.fortressonahill.com. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, pretty much any of your ordinary podcast carriers. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I believe those are all Fortress on a Hill as well. Yeah, and uh, and YouTube. You can watch the video version of our podcast on YouTube. Definitely, ch- definitely uh, check us out. We try, we try to build our, our telegram. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're working on it. Henry, Henry sucks at telegram. I really, <laughs> I'm not good at telegram. Rachel, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I forgot. Don't really follow me. Follow like Mujeres Marchalan at MMSATX and follow San Antonio PSL, PSL SATX to keep up with what we're doing. I'm not that exciting. <laughs> Thank you both for your, uh, for your time coming to talk to us about these uh, important issues. But Rachel, thank you for this article and an actual example of people trying to be humane, trying to change the society for the better and actually doing it. And it's amazing to see. So I'm really grateful that we could end on that, uh, on that hopeful note. Giovanni, as always, man, it's been a pleasure. And uh, we will uh, we will see you all next time. Thank you for uh, thank you for listening to us. You guys for coming. Yep. Take care. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill, and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts. Patreon, Spotify, you name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. I will know.